Uh, all right. Uh, I'm just looking at retired turbine engineer, electrical engineer, electric transmission planning engineer. Well, I'm happy to see that. We're going to talk about transmission a bit today. Uh, Jeffrey is a mechanical engineer, civil engineer, electrical engineer. Okay, mechanical, a nice group of engineers. So uh, personally, I'm an electrical engineer. I spent 35 years as a college professor teaching electrical engineering at Florida Atlantic University, after which I then spent eight years in the business of designing and installing photovoltaic systems. After which I finally decided when I was 70 years old, I'm just going to work for me and do what I like to do best. And that is teaching. So uh, here we are. Uh, I'm coming to you from the uh, rapidly, uh, well, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I heard this morning that Florida is very close to being the COVID-19 capital of the entire world. So believe me, I am sequestered in my office and have no plans for leaving, going anywhere. Okay, so thank you for your comments, and uh, that helps me a lot because uh, if you're all engineers mostly and civils and electricals, we can continue at a reasonable level here of a uh, technical level. Okay, so uh, let's move on here. Uh, this session today, Oh, and by the way, if I, I meant to say, if, if you have questions, questions are, are your, your, your ability to ask questions is what you're paying for today, hopefully to learn something as well. But uh, the reason we're live is so you can respond and we can respond live. If you have a question, uh, the quickest way to do that, if you'll simply type it in the Q&A box and I'll get a little flag waving on my screen and I will check what that is. If it's something that we're going to cover in detail later, then I'll do that. If it's, uh, and here's a Q&A. Uh, if it's something we're covering in detail later, I'll let you know that. If it's something that uh, we need an answer to right away, then we'll do that. And, uh, oh yes, uh, can you get copies of the slides I showed? Uh, I'm really glad, Jeffrey, that you asked that question. At the end of the session, you go to the website of uh, PDH Source, and you, uh, you you'll get some more information at uh, at the end. But yes, uh, the and the, set, the session is being recorded, <clears throat> and I encourage everybody to order the slides. You'll get them in a PDF format, no no extra charge. Uh, and uh, so that enables me to go through some of the more wordy slides a little bit more quickly. And those who seriously want to go over it again, you'll be able to do it on this slide. So thank you for asking a question. And uh, uh, PDH Source would like to answer this question live as well. So uh, uh, if I miss anything, Hisham, uh, chime on in and uh, uh, help us out here, okay? Yes, go ahead, Raj. Okay, all right. So was I correct? Everybody just needs to go to the website after the session is over and they can get the quiz there, they can get their certificate there, and they can uh, comment uh, on the evaluation of this program, whether it was worth their while, and they can get a set of slides. That's correct. I will, I'll put a note on the chat box in a minute. And do you have, uh, will, will you have coupons for free lunch as well? That'd be nice. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Anyway, we are doing the ultimate in social distancing right now. So uh, I guess the free lunch probably won't be a part of this program. Okay, this whole program is based on a study that was done back in 2012 by the National Renewable Energy Labs out in uh, Golden, Colorado. And the whole purpose of this was to determine whether it is feasible to get up to 90% renewables by 2050. Now keep in mind, this study was done in 2012. Uh, recently, 
I've done the math myself and I've convinced myself that by spending less than what we're currently spending on the pandemic, we can be 100% renewables by 2035. And uh, that I cover in more detail on a different webinar on uh, uh, global warming, which may also be of interest at some point. I believe we've got at least one person here who, who sat in on that a little while ago. In any case, uh, <clears throat> we're, we'll be augmenting the 2012 information when updating that to the extent possible. Any time the uh, uh, slide refers back to this study, it's going to be uh, uh, have an REFS on it, and uh, other sources will be credited either in the slide itself or at the end. Okay, so here we go. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to have an introduction. We just kind of had that, but we're going to have a little bit more. Then we're going to focus a little bit on how PV systems work and how wind systems, what's out there, a little history, so forth. And then uh, what happens, uh, what, what concerns do the utilities have uh, when we start putting large amounts of these particular sources on the grid? And uh, uh, obviously, if there's a disconnect between being able to grid connect these things and uh, uh, build large quantities of them, then, then there's a problem that needs to be solved by a whole bunch of engineers. And the fact of the matter is, we have the technology right now to have very large scale PV systems on the grid without even developing new stuff. And if somebody believes we're not going to develop anything new, I've got a bridge for sale up in Brooklyn. So in any case, um, how do you overcome the variability on the sources? Because that, that's the real issue here. The sun doesn't shine at night. That's pretty predictable, actually. Uh, the wind, who knows when that's going to blow and when it's not going to blow. But if it's not blowing, it's not making electricity. So what do we do uh, under those situations? Um, so let, let's uh, start with photovoltaics. Um, this happens to be a 10,000 watt uh, battery backup system at a school in Florida that was installed by Urban Solar, a company that uh, I was a part of way back in 2005 before they even were Urban Solar. But uh, here's what's going on. Uh, in 2018, 2.4 gigawatts of residential PV systems were installed in the United States. And I see there, I'm gonna quickly go up and see what the, uh, the question is up here. Uh, okay, I guess uh, we've answered the question. Okay, um, the total amount of PV installed in the United States in 2018 was 11.7 gigawatts. So therefore about 20% of total uh, solar installed was residential and the 80% was in the utility and the commercial sectors. We'll see why that's the case uh, very soon when we start looking at some of the economics. Globally, in 2018, photovoltaics exceeded 104 gigawatts added. So you know, when people say the United States is the only people doing anything about it, uh, here's a number that would refute that argument. Uh, in 2018, China itself installed 47 gigawatts. You know, we're looking at four times as much as the United States installed in China. And India installed 11 gigawatts. So, you know, there's folks out there who are really serious about installing photovoltaics. <clears throat> and, and the United States is, uh, is only one of, the, of many. Uh, there were 242,000 solar industry jobs in the United States in 2018 versus something like 70,000 uh, fossil fuel jobs. I don't know the exact number. Don't quote me on that one. Uh, efficiencies of photovoltaic cells continue to improve. They're up around 22% now with a maximum theoretical efficiency for silicon of around 27%. Back when I first got involved in installing PV systems, the efficiency were down around 12-13%. Uh, so <clears throat> that uh, when you've got an efficiency of 21% instead of 14%, it means you can get 50% more electricity out of the same footprint. So that in itself, uh, any roof, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're going to see some turnover of, uh, of systems, even though they live, last for 25 years, 
people are going to start replacing it, say, my goodness, if I can get 50 percent more electricity on my roof, I, I think I'm going to switch off and put my old system on the aftermarket. Uh, reliability continues to improve. There's not a whole lot of maintenance on these systems. And the costs are going down, 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 and they just keep on going down. And it's not just the modules, it's the electronics, it's the installation costs. So uh, well, we're going to take a look at that. Here's a little graph of photovoltaic module cost per watt. And as you can see, by 2015, it was down to less than a dollar. And I can tell you that in the year 2000, a lot of us were saying that the, the, the cost of the frame and the glass alone is limited to a dollar a watt. And here we are under, in 2015, down around 80%, 80 cents a watt. And in 2018, it was down to 32 cents a watt. And it's still going down. So all, all of these uh, rules here that, that we keep making up, and notice this is a logarithmic scale. So that means this is almost a straight line on a logarithmic scale, and everybody knows that means that they're declining exponentially, which is kind of interesting. And that, of course, that the exponential decline means it'll take an infinite number of years before they're free. But we can probably live with that at 32 per cents per watt and, and going down. Um, how much is there? What's being sent? Well, uh, here we go from 1975 on up through 2020. Uh, where were we at 2020? We were up out here at 2019. Uh, this graph was originally drawn up for inclusion in my textbook on photovoltaics that was published in 2016. So I was only able to get up to 2015 or so, 2014 with the data. But at that point, I had extrapolated a, a band of possibilities and we're right within that band of possibilities. Somewhere over 100,000 megawatts or 100 gigawatts of photovoltaics being manufactured and shipped every year. That's a lot. Cost of installation is about $3 a watt for residential in 2019, about $1.50 a watt for utilities in 2019. So that, uh, of course, you have to figure out, all right, how many kilowatt hours are generated and how long does it take to pay back and so forth. Point being though, the cost is going down in the utilities. That's, you can now see the reason why the utilities are uh, installing so much PV. Uh, at least this is part of the reason. This is what's been happening historically in terms of a wide range of energy sources. Um, we've, of course, been depending on fossil fuels, the three on top there for a long time, the top one being crude oil, our transportation source, coal is, uh, uh, has been historically a major electricity source and natural gas uh, has been uh, electricity source and projection on them is that they, uh, they, they've been pretty flat for, for a long time. Uh, hydro, those little houses there, uh, that's been going up. Uh, not, not really, really fast, but faster than almost anything else. Uh, nuclear has actually been going down. There's been a few blips where they've re restored a few uh, nuclear generation plants, but uh, for the most part, it's been going down. Now, remember, this is worldwide energy production. You're talking kilowatt hours, end use stuff here, and, and worldwide, not just the United States, okay? Uh, and the green line, that's the most interesting of all because that's the renewables, that's the wind and the solar, and there's a small amount of biomass and a few other things in there, but it's predominantly wind and solar, and they are still gaining at something more than 20% a year. And one might argue whether that's sustainable or not, but if you project that green curve out a ways, you'll see that by somewhere around 2030, between 2030 and 2035, if we keep up the current rate of increase of photovoltaic and wind installations, they will be up at the same order of magnitude because they only have to increase by a factor of five at this point to be up uh, with the uh, 
uh, fossil sources. So, and that, that can be done within the next 15 years. So that means that it will be possible to replace all of the fossil fuel sources with electricity made by renewables by 2035, if that's what we decide is important. All right. Uh, what did I do? I went backwards somehow. How did I do that? Why am I going backwards? Uh oh, this is weird. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end show and click really fast. Or no, let's see. Hold on. Next. I am clicking the same button and it was going the wrong direction. I don't know why. There we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, the, the interesting thing is 2019, uh, renewables actually were essentially the same as, as uh, production from nuclear. So, so we're not talking about small change anymore. We're talking about major, major contributions to the world energy consumption. Why? Well, this is a very, very busy slide. I hate to show it, except it's kind of pretty for artwork, but this is what's happening in the labs, folks. I mean, there's an incredible amount of research going on. And I would call your attention to a little curve, kind of in the lower right-hand corner, slightly up the graph a ways. They're, they're red circles with yellow dots in the middle. That is a technology that wasn't even on the map. It was totally under the radar in 2012. And by 2016, it had gone from about 12% up to 22.1% in terms of conversion efficiency uh, of the sun. And that, that, that's the uh, particular technology that is, is, is not been totally stabilized yet, but we need to watch that one and uh, that happens to be uh, perovskite cells, not stabilized as you see on the emerging PV graph there. So again, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this any longer just to show that uh, there's a lot going on there and there's no reason to believe that things in five years are going to be anywhere near what they are now. They're, everything is heading for better because of all the research. Uh, and if you order up the slides, you will get a picture of this. All right, so uh, if we're talking solar, let's uh, talk a little bit about the sun. Uh, the peak intensity is 1,000 watts per square meter. This is important to know because that means that if we could collect 100% of the sunlight coming in, then for every square meter, we could collect 1,000 watts. And that's if the sun is shining directly on a particular uh, place or if your measuring instrument is pointing directly at the sun. And of course, this doesn't happen very often. So most of the time, the sun intensity is less than 1,000 watts per square meter. Uh, but the testing criteria for photovoltaic modules and cells is a light source with a spectrum comparable to the sun that uh, radiates at 1,000 watts per square meter. Uh, and depending on technology, and you just saw a bunch of them, we, we, with uh, silicon right now, we can get a capture about 22% of it. Uh, most of the modules out there are in 20% range now, as opposed to 14, 15% long ago, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, depending where you live, this means that uh, in any, a year's time, a thousand watts of photovoltaics will generate somewhere between 1,000 and 2,200 kilowatt hours a year. All right, so 1,500 is pretty, pretty normal for most places. 1,000 means it's really cloudy or maybe it's a uh, uh, far northern or southern latitude. Uh, but as uh, the photovoltaics is not ruled out in Alaska, uh, works fine in the summer when they've got 20 hour days or so. Uh, if you got something to track that sun, you can make a lot of electricity in a day in the summer in Alaska. And uh, the 2200 is kind of like in a desert situation, the Mojave Desert or whatever. Um, up in the New England area, a lot of folks here up in Ohio in the north, 
somewhere around 1500 to 1600 kilowatt hours per kilowatt hour per kilowatt a year, depending on the orientation of the array is a reasonable number. Um, and there are lots of sophisticated performance models out there that take into account lots of things, including the, the ambient temperature, the cloud cover, and the efficiency of the equipment in the system. Because an inverter, for example, is not going to be operating at full power very much of the time. It uh, mostly be somewhere between half and 90%, probably. Uh, well, actually between zero and 90% when the sun is down. Uh, so knowing the amount of sunlight on the system, the model can take into equipment what the efficiency of the inverter is going to be. And so these models generally, uh, what they give you is the amount of AC that's available, the amount of AC power or energy that are available uh, any month of the year, any day of the year. When you get down to every day of the year, that gets a little iffy because who knows whether it's going to be sunny or rainy today or tomorrow or the same day next year. But when you start averaging over a month, then these things start becoming pretty reliable. And uh, the energy out of the photovoltaic module is directly proportional to the sunlight shining on the collector. That's an important thing to know. So if you've got 10% sunlight, you can get 10% of rated power out of a module. Okay, how about the wind? Uh, well, uh, yeah, it makes a little electricity. In 2016, there were 101,738 people employed in the wind industry. 54 gigawatts of wind power was installed worldwide in 2016. 4,866 gigawatts of total wind power were in place in 2016. In addition to the big windmills, there are 945,000 small wind turbines with a cumulative total worldwide 2014 capacity of 830 megawatts. That's 2014 data. Uh, I should try to find some more recent data, but for 2014, that's pretty good. And then we know the numbers continues to rise. Um, large wind turbine can generate about 2,300 kilowatt hours per year per kilowatt of wind turbine. And that's uh, pretty close to photovoltaics in the desert, okay? In terms of kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year. And construction cost on these turbines is somewhere between $1.5 and, and $2 a watt if they're onshore. Best performance requires sustained winds. That's something that's important to know because uh, the output of the wind power machine is not linearly proportional to the wind velocity. Uh, just knowing that the force of the wind is proportional to the square of the wind velocity. And we know that power is equal force times velocity. And we're also converting a linear velocity into an angular velocity. So we've kind of got a velocity cube feature here, which would imply that if you double the speed of the wind, you can increase the power by a factor of eight. Uh, not completely accurate because of various nonlinearities in the system, but still uh, you kind of need the wind to keep on blowing to maximize the output of, the, of a wind system. But again, the models cover that and they give you a pretty good idea whether it's going to be worth it. Now, the LCOE, that's levelized cost of energy, is the way various sources are compared because that's basically a life cycle costing thing. Uh, what it says is over the lifetime cost of making electricity with your system, what would you have to charge per kilowatt hour to get your money back? All right, so here's your comparison, uh, natural gas, six cents a kilowatt hour. Advanced nuclear, we want to build some more nuclear, fine, let's go for it. Nine cents a kilowatt hour. Somebody's going to have to decide whether that's economical or not. Onshore wind, 4.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Whoa, uh, that's cheaper than natural gas. No wonder they're building so many windmills. Photovoltaics, 5.8 cents a kilowatt hour. Hydro, 6.4. This is from the Department of Energy in 2017, okay? So, uh, and, and the numbers are even better in 2020 
in terms of the uh, uh, renewables. So this is why people are interested, folks. It's all about the economics. There's a little bit there about the environment and so forth, thank goodness, because it would be really nice if things that are good for the environment are also good for the economics, and that's exactly what we have facing us here. All right, and that's what we're going to talk about. And that's why they're growing so fast, the installation of wind and solar. That's why we need to be concerned about what effect are they going to have on the grid. All right, here's a story about wind power. It's been increasing more linearly than exponentially, but it's still, once you start with a large number and increase linear at a reasonable rate, that's still a pretty good, pretty fast increase. Where's the wind? Oh, hey, our friends in China again. They are outwinding us. And uh, so people say, hey, you know, uh, why should the United States have to do all this stuff? Because uh, nobody else is doing anything. Well, they haven't been keeping their eye on the fall because uh, it is not true that nobody else is doing anything. I'm going to check the, uh, the Q's and A's here for a minute. Hold on. What are the conversion units? Wait a minute now. Uh, Jeffrey, I'm not exactly sure which conversion units do you mean? Uh, we're converting sunlight into available kilowatt hours, wind into available kilowatt hours. Uh, I guess I need you to uh, expand on that just a little bit. I am not quite sure what you're asking. Uh, oh, maybe about the percentage uh, of output and uh, if that's what it is, and I'm guessing, Okay, kilowatt hour per kilowatt per year. Oh, oh, oh. In other words, that means that if I install a kilowatt of photovoltaics or wind or whatever other energy source, how many kilowatt hours a year can I expect that to make for me? All right, so that's what kilowatt hours per kilowatt per year means. And it's that's scalable then, see, because if I can get 1,500 kilowatt hours per year out of a 1 kW system, then out of a 5 kW, I can expect 7,500 kilowatt hours per year. All right, so hopefully that uh, will square that away. And uh, let's see, I think I see something over here. Oh, there's some stuff in the chat box. Let's see what we've got there. Hold on. Uh, Okay. I do not see start or continue course. Uh, I need for Isham to answer that question. Okay, please log in first. Got it, Gregory, all panelists. And why is so much federal subsidy needed to get homeowners to use PV? Uh, just to, uh, I'll answer that. <clears throat> it kind of levels the playing field because every other energy source is subsidized about the same amount as solar is right now. And the solar subsidy is on the decrease, by the way, it was 30%. It's now 26% and it's going down every year. So uh, uh, I don't know how many have heard about the uh, uh, Price Anderson Act, but that is a federal guarantee that uh, a utility can't go bankrupt if they build a nuclear plant. Uh, there's a limit on the insurance for in case there's an accident and there would be no nuclear out there without Price Anderson. Uh, there's the oil depletion allowance and it goes on and on. So uh, uh, photovoltaics having a, a subsidy basically puts them right up there with others who have subsidies that nobody knows about. Okay. and. Uh, so, okay, that, I guess, let's see, we got any more messages here? Uh, yes, okay. I wanna encourage everybody to occasionally look at the chat space also, because that's where you'll be getting your messages from PDH source as well. And the chat comes under, uh, at the top of your screen, you probably got a set of icons, uh, uh, for muting and starting videos and accounts participants. I'm not sure which ones you've got on your screen, uh, but at the far right-hand side, there's a more 
And under more is where the chat box is. Now, well, I'm going to be mostly responding to Q and A's, uh, but I will occasionally be looking up at the chat box as well. Okay. So uh, question here, where's the wind action? Well, here's where, where quite a bit of it is. Uh, United States is number two, but we're trailing pretty far behind, as you can see. Uh, we're at about 7,500 uh, megawatts installed capacity versus uh, uh, about 24,000 uh, megawatts installed capacity in China. All right. Uh, and, and the, the other thing is the wind power is not cost effective everywhere. There are some regions that just don't have enough wind. Uh, the best wind is a sustained 18 mile an hour wind. And uh, there you can redesign, but as the wind velocity gets lower than that, that's not so good. And if the wind is gusty, that is really tough on the bearings and the mechanical parts of a big wind machine. So uh, that, that's why there are certain places where you don't see them. Uh, and we'd already talked about linear proportionality and high velocity for wind. So, uh, but that doesn't mean there's no wind out there. And it's very possible as global warming continues that there will be more wind blowing because that is one way of dissipating some of that excess energy. So uh, that's why some of the storms are getting stronger and uh, so this is something to keep an eye on for those of you who are planning to be around in 2050. Okay, so intro. What happens to the grid as a result? Well, grid's out there to supply load as the demand for the load occurs. So therefore, if you want to turn on light, there's got to be electricity available for that. And that's what, if you want to turn on your water heater or if you want to, whatever you want to turn on or turn off, the grid has to be able to deal with that. And uh, <clears throat> grid has different components. One is base load, and that's basically the, the lowest requirement of the grid at any point at any, in, during any day. Uh, total load is the base load plus the variable load. So it generally goes down to the base load somewhere around midnight, one o'clock, one or two in the morning. And then uh, starts going up a bit. And uh, we'll take a look at what that picture looks like soon. Uh, some loads very slowly, others very quickly. If you turn your, uh, uh, your dryer off, uh, that's a quick 5kW that's not there anymore. So, uh, <clears throat> Whereas if you plug in your electric vehicle, that could be somewhere between, say, 1,200 watts and, I don't know, 10 kW or so, depending on the model, that uh, can either ramp up slowly or start up quickly, depending on the design of the charger. And then there's some sources that you can change the output very quickly and other sources are slow to respond. Uh, nuclear is slow to respond, coal, any of the big sources are slow to respond because they, you have to add extra heat and they have to reach equilibrium and the time constants there are kind of long, but the uh, uh, things like uh, uh, rotating sources like uh, say natural gas uh, turbine uh, or, or jet fuel turbine or whatever, once they're rotating at uh, 1800 RPMs or 3600, whatever the design rotation speed might be, uh, just like the generator you may have um, in your garage somewhere, uh, the, the gasoline generator, uh, it may be rated at 5000 watts, but uh, it's perfectly happy to provide 100 watts. It's gonna be a whole lot less efficient in terms of uh, kilowatt hours per gallon at 100 watts than it is at 4,000 watts, but at least they can very quickly bounce back and forth. And, and yes, as you increase the load, you increase the torque on the machine. And that's what the governor is there for. It, it applies more fuel to make sure it maintains a constant speed, but it does it quickly. So it's just something needs to be known that uh, it's one of the important characterizations of a source is how quickly can it respond to a change in load. So, 
Generation mix has to include things that can start quickly, and that, that's one of the constraints. So we'll look at how we're going to deal with that in the era that's coming on of renewables replacing fossil, which is highly likely going to be the case within the next 20 years. Uh, another concern over distributed renewables is uh, when the sun goes under a cloud, then all of a sudden all these neighborhood sources are not adding electricity to the grid and utility has to add more. And uh, what this involves for the, and there are a number of uh, utility engineers on the, uh, this uh, uh, webinar, I think, and, and you, you know as well as anybody that those contacts on the uh, transformers and the substations are mechanical for the most part. And <coughs> the more they switch back and forth, even if they may be in oil, there's some, some arcing and they, they uh, wear out faster and it costs money to replace them. So, uh, uh, but one day they will probably not be mechanical. I mean, we're talking about electronically equally converting many, many uh, megawatts of of DC electricity back into AC and from AC to DC. The transmission folks know about DC transmission lines and the huge electronic equipment used at both ends. And uh, so, so, so there's no reason why the switching on the taps of the transformers in the substations can't be converted over to electronic switching. And for that matter, the transformers themselves at some point, maybe all, maybe we'll get rid of all that, that iron and just do it all electronically because <clears throat> the technology is there to be able to do it. Okay, um, what else is there in the grid? Well, it, it's a bunch of systems there. It's, it's fuel and the resources for uh, uh, generating the power, lots of ways of generating electricity, uh, transmission and distribution lines, high voltage, medium voltage, loads out there. Without the loads, there wouldn't be any reason for the grid itself. Uh, there's networks and measurements uh, in order to see what's going on out there. There's information and control systems that uh, uh, again, they, they pick up the information from the networks and the measurements and they send it off to the control systems to do whatever has to be done to keep that output stable. There's ne virtual networks of money and business relationships because if you want to build a new transmission line or a new nuclear plant or a big solar system, it costs money. And so you got to find somebody willing to be a part of that. <laughs> and of course, let's don't forget the regulators. Uh, none of us could get along without them. We'd probably uh, start losing sleep at night if we uh, didn't know those regulators were out there to, to, to make sure we did our jobs the way we were supposed to. So how do you model the grid? Because it helps to be able to model the grid just like it be, helps to be able to model hurricanes so you have an idea where it's going and, and so uh, in general the grid has real and reactive power. For those of you not familiar with reactive power, and most, most everybody in their first uh, circuits course learned something about the fact that the, in AC, the current uh, waveform is not necessarily in phase with the voltage waveform. And in an inductive load, like a motor, the current is gonna be behind, or it's gonna reach its peak value at some time later than the voltage reaches its peak value. And if that's the case, then there's gonna be some reactive power. And the, the total volt amperes is the square root of the sum of the squares of the real power and the reactive power. And the volt amperes is equal to the volts and the amps uh, present on a particular transmission line or a distribution line or, or even a, uh, a service within a building. All right, so the point being that generation source needs to supply the real and reactive power. And because there's real and reactive components in the load, that means the grid tends to behave like an RLC circuit for the electricals out there or a mass spring dash pot circuit for the mechanicals out there. And you all know what those things can do. If they become under damp, they become very unstable. 
So normally the system is under damped. And so normally if there's a perturbation of the output on the grid or the, 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 the grid situation, normally it's over damped. So it tends to go back to, to normal, but uh, there are situations where that's not necessarily the case. Uh, because one thing, sources tend to either ramp on or to ramp off. So if you model this thing, then the grid response is a lot like modeling the response of an RLC circuit to an input ramp function or to a, uh, say a set of shock absorbers on an automobile to uh, uh, hitting a, a big bump in the road. Uh, how are they going to respond? And that's really important to have an idea what the grid's going to do if things like that happen, because then you can add additional components and structure to uh, eliminate any any negative result of that kind of a response. So, uh, and the whole bottom line is that uh, you just don't want to ramp too fast, either up or down, uh, in a manner that would lead to instability of the grid. Okay. So, what's the result? Well. Um, Predictably, it says we need to be able to smooth out rapid changes. Uh, but something is a little bit less obvious is that the generators are not designed to absorb power. Because if there's a lot of photovoltaic power on the grid, you know, power flows in one direction or another and generators, fossil fuel generators, nuclear generators are used to, and hydroelectric generators are used to power leaving them. Now in the hydroelectric case, there's pump storage hydro. We're going to get to that later a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> one thing that needs to be done is to make sure that we don't put so much solar and wind on the, the, the grid that it exceeds the needs and the loads of the system at the time. Because if that happens, then the only place else that electricity has to go is to those rotating generators. And they just really, uh, that, that makes the prime mover very, very unhappy as its source of generation. So uh, somebody needs to think about that. And of course it's being thought of and, and measures are now available to prevent power flowing in the wrong direction. Uh, we just need to recognize where that might happen. And most important, place for it flowing in the wrong direction. Uh, substations, transformers, transformers don't care what direction the power is flowing. Um, but when you get to the generators, then you need to be able to recognize the direction of power flow and make sure it doesn't go the wrong way and maybe divert it somewhere as we will be talking about. So 2012, NREL did a study of these concerns and the, we, that's the one we talked about at the very beginning. And uh, here's what they concluded. And uh, <clears throat> basically the bottom line is, yeah, uh, we, we can do it. We can easily supply 80% of total United States electricity in 2050 while meeting electricity demand on an hourly basis in every region of the United States, bottom line. And you can read that in more, uh, you can read that five more times if you order up the slides. <clears throat> so the renewables <clears throat> be a combined mix of nuclear uh, uh, we got 20% left if we do that. So the remaining would be nuclear, natural gas, clean, clean coal, and energy efficiency. And uh, this was a conclusion they reached in 2012 when people believed there was clean coal. A lot of question about that, whether there really is any such thing or whether that's an oxymoron. But at this point, it is not difficult to do the math and to show that uh, none of the fossils is really necessary if we plan it properly. So how can we get to this 80% renewable goal? And I almost want to cross that out and say 100% renewable goal because the same thing, all these things are necessary to go to 100% as well as the 80% obviously. <clears throat> Uh, except maybe conventional generation won't need to be flexible anymore if we don't have any more. But if we have it, it needs to be flexible. That means you can turn it on and off fairly quickly and it will meet changes in the load fairly quickly. And right now that's 
is the kind of generation that's helping solve any problems of renewables on the grid. <clears throat> grid storage is going to be really big. Uh, we have a separate two-hour webinar on storage alone. And uh, there, there's just a whole lot going on in that area. It's, it's a, a hot area. And there's a lot of engineering available that's going to be, need to be done for grid storage. So I hope some of you will get a chance to get involved with that. Um, <clears throat> new transmission lines. And we already got people online here who are involved with that. So uh, uh, that helps make things more efficient to have transmission lines. I know it's not easy to build them. A lot of permitting issues. Don't you dare try to build one across the Everglades and so on. But uh, if we can find proper corridors, uh, throwing in some new transmission from uh, large wind farms that are away from population centers, large solar farms that are away from population centers. Uh, Got to get it to the user and pretty hard to do that without transmission. Uh, more responsive loads. We've been working on that for a long time. Uh, uh, I can remember 25, 30 years ago when the uh, Florida Power and Light came out and said, hey, would you guys allow us to control your water heater and your air conditioner and your swimming pool pump, which we didn't have? <clears throat> if they could just turn it on and off, they would give us a, a discount on our electric bill. So uh, now, though, with smart homes, you don't need Florida Power and Light to say that. Uh, your smart home can be trained to do whatever it needs to do to make the utility happy. Um, Changes in power systems operation. All right, uh, more robust substation taps. And this is what we can get, significant reduction in generation costs for one thing. And a lot less water use. Utility scale PV can be made with 1.3 fluid ounce per kilowatt hour generated. That's not very much compared to 25 fluid ounces per kilowatt hour for natural gas turbines. So where water is an issue, wait a minute, what's water used for with PV? Well, it's used to clean them off if they get dusty. And if you got a big storm, dust storm from the Sahara coming over, you need to clean them off a little bit. But in Florida, we don't have to clean on it. No, nobody takes that into account here in Florida because it rains enough that the rain itself keeps them clean. So, and, and that's true for a lot of places. So this is kind of an average number. Um, significant reductions in electric sector greenhouse gases. And, and it also reduces the nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides that you get from coal. So uh, there's no fuel with uh, solar and wind, it's the wind and the sun. So there's no greenhouse gas emissions except from when you construct them and decommission them. So, and that's a, a whole lot less than, because you also have to construct and decommission other electric generation as well. So, and the, the amount of energy involved there and the amount of greenhouse gas is about the same. So we just have to compare the uh, emissions by fuel, which is zero for renewables and trillions of pounds per year for the uh, uh, fossil sources. So who's responsible for all this? Well, fortunately, unless some of these have been eliminated, but I don't think so, like various agencies that might have responded to the uh, COVID-19 problem, but we're not talking about that today. It's hard for me not to talk about it, knowing that it's like almost afraid to go to the grocery store. But, uh, <clears throat> There's the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, one, two, three, four, five, six different groups. Okay, we're gonna look at them individually. Uh, and in addition to these groups that are actually doing the work to keep the grid running efficiently, there's a bunch of regulatories out there at all levels as well that uh, wanna get their fingers in the pie. So what's the NERC, the North American Electric Reliable Corporation? Well, this is what it is. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, there's three, six, seven, eight different groups. And uh, these are groups 
that are responsible for the reliability of electrical generation and transmission within their geographical areas. And notice Texas is kind of on its own there. And also notice that Canadians are involved here. It's you can see up there in the MRO, the Midwest, there's uh, uh, Ontario, not Ontario, sorry, Manitoba and Alberta involved. So um, we're, we're partnering with the Canadians. We, we get a fair amount of electricity done from them and they get some from us depending on who's making it at the time. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the overseer of everything that goes on, the National Electric Reliability, or the, sorry, North American Electric Reliability has, is under FERC, all right? And they do, uh, they're, they're responsible for reliability, operating and standards by way of balancing authorities, regional entities, and other smaller groups that are responsible under to, to, to the uh, NER seats, okay? So uh, what do the balancing authorities do? Well, they're responsible for balancing between load and generation. That sounds pretty important. We need to have as much generation as load and we don't want a whole lot more generation or very much less generation because either one leads to inefficiencies and disruptions. So we wanna try to keep them right, right on they need to maintain frequency. <clears throat> and for that matter, they need to maintain phase because you can't interconnect unless you're in phase as well. So, well, unless you're interconnecting using DC transmission lines, that's another story. Uh, they maintain ties to adjacent balancing authorities because if they can't do what they need to do, maybe they may have need to buy a little electricity from somebody else to make it happen. Or maybe they'll sell some to somebody else to help them out. All right, and uh, it's the balancing authority's job to establish the generation schedules. And uh, so they either buy or sell the adjacent systems in order to, for everybody to, to benefit. And in the process of buying and selling, it may be that they will buy from a, uh, an adjacent uh, balancing authority uh, simply because the adjacent balancing authority has a source that is less expensive than what they have in reserve. <clears throat> and their job is to optimize the performance. And performance always involves costs. You want to have the most reliable kilowatt hours for the smallest number of dollars. So uh, that's the job of the balancing authority. So in order to do that, they have to schedule a generation and, and, and only bring in inefficient generation when it's an absolute ne necessity because the efficient stuff can't do it first. Okay, so what are the en regional entities? What are they all about? What do they do? Well, they're on the map, the NERC map, uh, the Western and uh, Midwest and so forth. And what they do is their responsibility is to improve the reliability of the bulk power system. <clears throat> and they can acknowledge the differences among regions because some regions, uh, and then also uh, all segments of the electric industry are partake in this. The, the generation people, the transmission people, the storage people, the uh, utilities. Uh, you know, utilities are no longer totally vertically integrated. They uh, have to buy electricity from any generator who has any good sinusoidal electricity to sell. Uh, they can use transmission lines that are provided by others who uh, uh, the transmission lines are not necessarily owned by the utility. All right, so therefore all, all of the players in the industry are, <coughs> uh, can, can be members of the, uh, the regional entities. And uh, these account for all electricity in the United States, Canada, and, and a little bit of Mexico. So then there's utilities and power poles. And this uh, has a little historical significance because it goes back to the 1935 Federal Power Act and back to 1992 Energy Policy Act, which 
were designed to provide electric, reliable electricity at minimum cost to everybody, including out in, in, in the, uh, the far, far away from the city out in the country. And they are regulated to ensure just and reasonable rates because, and of course that's not necessary because we know that all utilities are working to do just and reasonable rates regardless of whether the Public Service Commission is out there or the Public Utilities Commission. But <clears throat> well, just to be sure, add a little level of redundancy and I'll create a few jobs. Uh, sometimes you may notice that my tongue gets caught in my cheek on some of my observations here. Um, <clears throat> never let it be said that uh, messenger is against regulation because uh, I've dealt with the regulators and I understand their, their issues. So, um, and they're there and they can be a, an important part of the team. Um, members in the utility and power pools include the internet, uh, I'm sorry, the investor owned utilities, municipal utilities, co-ops, federal and state, federal Utilities, there are federal utilities. Yeah, there sure are. Uh, there are state utilities, Tennessee Valley Administration, or Tennessee Valley TBA, is that an administration or authority? Um, as federal, think about Bonneville Power Association, up uh, a lot of uh, hydropower up in the Northwest. So yeah, there, the feds own some uh, power generation, the states own some, and uh, municipals, co-ops, and investors. Uh, a, lot, a lot of different members. <clears throat> There's uh, power poles in Pennsylvania, New York, in other words, the Northeast were organized to cut costs through power exchanges across the regional networks. Uh, somebody got a, a, a new power plant that's more efficient and uh, it wasn't worth their while to just build it for themselves, but if they could get a, sign a contract to sell it to a neighboring uh, uh, utility through a power exchange, then uh, they can all, everybody could win on that deal. So um, what about the regulatory constraints? Well, certainly utility system planning, uh, there kind of has to be a go-to for planning utilities. I mean, sure, the utilities could all get together and form their own little committee with a chair and so forth, <clears throat> but uh, usually, government has decided we'll have a commission to regulate and then utilities will all just all get to come up to the meetings and talk about how the regulation ought to work to make everybody happy. <clears throat> and uh, again, historically, before 1990, the investor-owned utilities did most of it because all by themselves because they were totally vertically integrated from generation to almost to the loads. Uh, but then again, in 1992, when the Energy Policy Act came on, then it said, okay, utilities, uh, <clears throat> we've got some generators out there, like the folks in the Everglades who burn their sugar cane for bagasse, <clears throat> or the, burn their bagasse, which is the sugar cane uh, leftovers, and that produces heat and they want to make electricity and sell it to you. So you got to buy that, even though they're not part of your utility. And then there's the people uh, who uh, are, are, are mining this phosphate and they have to make uh, uh, acid in order to uh, mine the phosphate. And they, so they do that by making sulfuric acid and burning the sulfur. And that's very exothermic and all that heat can be used to make electricity. So they want to sell it to you too. So you got to buy it in 1992. Uh, I can remember those days well. Uh, the utilities really didn't want to do that because they claimed that it wasn't going to help them any because they still had to maintain all their transmission for when the uh, sugarcane folks weren't burning their big ass. They were only burning it for a month or so out of the year. So. Similar arguments have been used for against solar and wind. So uh, these are things that needed to be solved. And, and back in 1992 was uh, sort of the beginning of thinking about open access. <clears throat> uh, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, order number 888 and 889 in 1996 uh, kind of spelled out the implementation of the uh, uh, 
Energy Policy Act of 92. And Rule 88, what that did was un unbundle transmission services uh, from the sailor marketing. And uh, the ARRA back in 2009, the American Recovery, oh dear, it's the Recovery Act in 2009, led to the De uh, Department of Energy initiation of coordinated interconnection wide transmission planning. So, uh, yeah, it was even in part of trying to get. Uh, out of that nasty recession we were in back there. And in 2011, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission ordered uh, order number 2000 uh, was intended to foster greater cooperation in generation and transmission planning. And <clears throat> now one, one could argue that, that it's probably actually working because whenever you can create a win-win situation, then uh, uh, things tend to work a whole lot better. So transmission organizations, ISOs, uh, that's one kind. RTOs is another kind. I'm going to flick through this kind of quickly because again, if you really want to memorize all this stuff, you can order up the slides at the end of the, the program. <clears throat> uh, All right, so we got uh, merchant transmission organization. All right, the plan for transmission. And, and, and then they go out and look for the money for them. So that's that other part again, that you, you can't do transmission lines unless you can pay for the construction. Uh, they don't pay for themselves until they start moving electricity. So you gotta upfront some of that cost, a goodly amount of that cost. Maybe like all of that cost with the hope that you'll get your money back once they start moving electricity. So here's a map of <clears throat> where the independent system operators and regional transmission organizations are. Again, we're not gonna go over these all, that's just they're there and they're not necessarily everywhere. <clears throat> they're, they're in areas where it's been deemed that it's, it's useful to have their presence. And you can see where it's fairly high uh, if, if they're talking about transmission from one area to another, uh, Florida clearly <clears throat> there's some transmission lines from Georgia to Florida, but not a whole lot of transmission from Florida to other states. So not every state is involved here. Okay, so what about the grid reliability? It helps a little bit to know something about grid reliability because this is something we need to deal with when we're talking about the addition of uh, renewable sources. Uh, I'm going to take a look here. Let's see, any Q's and A's? Uh, that one's already been answered. Any... Uh, any chats? I don't see any chats. Okay. All right. We now have uh, 15 participants. Uh, that would account for a couple of the rings I've heard. Okay. For the new participants, if you would, if you can just quickly type into the Q&A, uh, your name, your discipline, and your state. Uh, we're just trying to get a handle on the count of uh, how many electrical engineers, how many mechanical engineers uh, are, are participating here. So if you could just do that for us and uh, we'll compare that with the list at the end. Okay, so reliability means uh, simply uh, are you meeting the <clears throat> customer end use needs? But not just are you meeting them, but even if you have reduced system availability, can you still meet them? All right, that's important. All right, so. Uh, oh, oh, there it is. Adequacy, what's that? Oh, that's the ability of an electric system to supply the aggregate electrical demand and energy requirements of the end use customers at all times. And this means all times taking into account scheduled and reasonably unexpected outages of system elements. So that means <clears throat> adequacy is a system that you expect to have unexpected 
or you expect the unexpected. All right. So, gee, that's, can't do the job for the statistician there to figure out what the unexpected might be and how do you expect it and how do you deal with it. Anyway, that's all part of adequacy and security <clears throat> defines the ability of a system to withstand sudden disturbances such as short circuits or nasty things like un unanticipated loss of power system elements, say a generator or a transmission line or something like that. Uh, we've all seen some of the uh, results of uh, systems not quite being designed to do all this. Uh, the, the, that big blackout we had in the Northeast back, what was that, it was almost 20 years ago or so, where uh, it was just a matter of a couple of lines were overloaded somewhere, but that started a daisy chain of events that shut down a goodly part of the Northeast. Um, lots been done to study that and, and e avoid that from here on out. But anyway, reliability, adequacy, security, pretty important things. So grid stability, what about that? Well, it's the ability of power system to maintain its equilibrium under normal, abnormal, and disturbances. And assisting planning and operation requires that all areas of an interconnect have to operate within specified voltage and frequency limits. Okay, so it's got design, make sure that happens. And, and you know, what, what effect on these things might these renewables have? So uh, without knowing what the things are, it's pretty hard to anticipate what the problems might be with the utility, utilities. But fortunately, all these things are well-defined and therefore, how do you, uh, renewables have to uh, uh, be designed and operated uh, uh, is automatically incorporated into these discussions. So <clears throat> generation transmission has to operate within normal limit. Overload those transmission lines, they get hot, they expand. They, uh, well, and that, that, that's bad. If there's, uh, they can drop, if they drop too far. Anyway, uh, another thing is planning reserves or reserve margin, you know, most of know that a utility is somewhere has uh, 10 to 15% additional reserve generation up and running <coughs> and ready at any time to take care of these kinds of emergencies. So it's just additional capacity that's ready to go. It's available at all times. So that, you know, in a way that's, energy wasted, but that's the price you pay for reliability uh, because these things, even if they're not adding electricity to the grid, they're burning fuel. And uh, uh, for that matter, they, they've got uh, maintenance staff working on them. So, but there's a price to pay for grid security. Um, I knew that everybody would want to see a couple of graphs in, in, in Lolly and, and, and Lollop, of course. Uh, imagine the transmission people and some of the double E's on, on here, board here, but there may be some people who are not familiar with these and I, it just, it's something that everybody really should know because the acronyms are so neat for one thing. But we got loss of load probability and loss of load expectation. They're two different things, okay? The, Loss of load expectation, going to that first, it means it's the, uh, how many days in 10 years do you think you will lose your load? In other words, uh, how, how many days will your, your system be down in a 10 year period? And the typical target is to keep it less than one day. <clears throat> and, and you know, a, a good hurricane can really mess that up for Florida Power and Light, for example. Uh, they, they can lose load for a couple of weeks uh, in certain areas. So uh, you know, certain areas don't really have a uh, one day and 10 year loss of load expectation. That's including the area where I live. On the other hand, for the utility, uh, they try to uh, meet that. Now the loss of load probability is simply the likelihood that the load will be lost. So it's possible, and then there's the effect of load carrying capacity. So we've got three nice new 
acronym, so now we can draw a picture. <clears throat> and the picture, what it does is it plots the loss of load expectation versus the loss of load pro probability versus the existing and new generation for, in other words, let's take a look at the blue curve. That's the LOLE versus load for the existing generation. And you'll notice that the, at 10 gigawatts, the loss of load expectation is 0.1 day per year, which is one day in 10 years, okay? So let's say we want to improve on that. Well, one way to do that is to add additional generation. So let's say we, we want to have an additional 400 megawatts so that we have, instead of 10 gigawatts, we'll have 10.4 gigawatts and still have an LOLE of only one day in 10 years. See if we, uh, generate more than that, or if the load is more than that, then the LOLE goes up. So if we want that extra 400 megawatts at an LOLE of 0.1, it means we're going to need a lot more than 400 megawatts of generation in order to achieve that. Because you'll notice that those, the blue curve and the brown curve are 700 mega, 750 megawatts separating them at the LOLE of about 0 0.7, 0 0.07, I mean. So just something to keep in mind that uh, you, if you need an extra 400 megawatts reliably, you're going to have to build more than that. I'm just pulling one of my cables here. I hope that I'm still <coughs> coming through. Okay, so this is the bottom line. If you want an extra ELCC of 400 megawatts, then you need more than 400 megawatts to make that happen. Here's that typical utility load profile we were talking about. So down here, right around uh, the three or four o'clock in the morning, you see where we bottom out to our base load. <clears throat> that little red curve is for the north in the winter when there's some electric heat coming on early in the morning to warm places up. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's basically a curve that, interesting, look, that little glitch at 5 p.m. is when people leave their office, turn off their lights, and go home, and uh, turn their lights back on again at home, and start cooking. So, it, 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 it's something that a lot of us haven't thought about, that, uh, yeah, we peak out somewhere around 4 p.m. In, in the load, typical utility load profile, and then all of a sudden at 5 o'clock, there's a quick dip as the offices close and the lights go down. So <clears throat> what about generators? Let's talk a little bit about generation. And uh, we've already commented on these. Uh, so we, we, we already have talked about everything on this slide. Um, and, and, and just the whole idea is how long does it take for it to get up to synchronous output frequency? And the nice thing about, elect about the uh, photovoltaics, for example, is it takes a few milliseconds to get up to synchronized output frequency because it's not rotating, it's all electronic. So that's one nice feature of, uh, <clears throat> and even wind generators can use, uh, can, can use inverters in order to uh, stabilize the output frequency. Uh, small generators, as we mentioned earlier, not very efficient at, uh, at small fractional loads and their maximum efficiency is up around 90% load. Uh, and that's because they have to maintain their 3600 or 1800 RPM of uh, rotational speed by burning gasoline or diesel, whatever it might be. On the other hand, an inverter model that can slow down at lower fractions of load. And uh, because the, the AC coming out of the rotating generator is converted to DC and then runs into an inverter that converts it back up again. And the conversion to DC and the conversion back up to AC can be done at about 95% efficiency. So that's why you see a number of <clears throat> uh, the, the nice little inverter generators are, are, are nice because when they're running at a lower uh, 
uh, lower than rated output, they, they become extremely quiet to the, to the point where you can walk past them and maybe not even realize they're running, especially if you wear hearing aids like I do. So uh, fuel consumption is a really a big deal because you can see that inverter uh, models get a whole lot more kilowatt hours per gallon at reduced loads than the standard models. Now this is small stuff uh, that you might have at home, but this is all kind of scalable, except it's not, uh, it's scalable in that as the size of the generator gets bigger, the efficiency goes up. <clears throat> With a, an electronic inverter, the efficiency curve looks something like this. Uh, the only difference is that now the uh, more modern inverters, which don't have uh, transformers in there, they're transformerless inverters, we're looking at 98% efficiency peak instead of 95%. <clears throat> but the nice thing is, I mean, this is basically an uninterruptible power source. It, it turns on immediately uh, if it's needed, or it, it simply runs all the time. It all depends on uh, <clears throat> on, on, on what the, the kind of inverter is and what the application is. Security constraint unit commitment, another acronym. Everybody should know about it. It's just a matter of uh, when do you commit a particular unit for use. And if it's a big one, you have to commit it 24 to 4 hours, 48 hours in advance in order to allow it to start up. All right. Um, <clears throat> Load forecast usually is about within about 2% of peak load. In other words, uh, my forecast for the load tomorrow down here with good weather forecasting and knowledge of historically what various loads uh, profiles look like, uh, it's possible to forecast within about 2% for a period 24 to 48 hours in advance. So that helps to determine when you can need to start up uh, larger thermal units. Uh, because if you got too much or too little, you got inefficient operation if you just have spinning reserves, necessary, but if you have to pay for it. And an undercommitment means that uh, you, you, you need to, uh, way too much expensive peaking equipment. And so, here we got uh, a couple of Q's and A's. Let's take a look here. <clears throat> oh, okay. Oh, IOUs, that means investor owned utilities. Uh, that's all the big ones, Florida Power and Light, for example, here down in Florida. Uh, what's the big IOU up in New York? Uh, uh, I drive by that every time I had to go to Long Island, except I can't go there anymore. Uh, well, you, you all know what they are. Large thermal units. Okay, that's like a huge uh, nuclear plant, huge coal plant. Things that have a lot of thermal inertia to fire them up, get them up to speed. Okay, so um, let's see if there's any more here. Yeah, a nuclear power plant takes generally at least 24 hours to get it up to full power. And, and the last thing you want to have to do is have to ramp it down again because it takes so long to turn these things on and off. <clears throat> and the same is true with the coal plants. Uh, okay, I guess that, that covers the questions for the moment. Uh, so the balancing authorities, their job is to establish schedules of when do the various generation uh, sources, uh, which one are going to, which ones are going to be used when, to make sure that the LOLE is reached for the region where that happens to be. Oh, another question here. Oh, and there's one over there too. I better get that one. Uh, let's see. What do we got? Uh, Oh, power factor limits are also considered in greater operation. Uh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, and that, that's something that's uh, 
now being thought of very carefully in terms of integrating and renewables into the grid. Uh, it, it, it has been historically the case that, uh, for example, um, IEEE uh, 1741 requires uh, photovoltaic inverters to run at a unity power factor. <clears throat> uh, that is, voltage and current have to be in phase. But now the, the most recent uh, uh, modification to that allows the uh, owner of the utility and the, uh, the owner of the uh, uh, photovoltaic system or wind system for that matter to sign an agreement with the utility <clears throat> to vary the power factor. And inverters are perfectly capable of doing that. If they can maintain it at a perfectly unity power factor, they can also run that power factor 0.8 leading or lagging or whatever they have to do. So thank you for pointing that out. Uh, uh, Gornath. And Jeffrey, <clears throat> short break. You are allowed to take a short break. Turn up your volume. And let's see, will the new normal due to present corona pandemic lower or affect the grid peaks or load profiles? I wish I knew. I've been tracking the, the, the curves on corona and I don't know. I do have a friend at a local utility but I, I can't answer that right now. One would think <clears throat> that uh, given that uh, when, when, when all the uh, retail establishments were closed down, there was a lot of lighting that clearly affected the load peak. I'd had to. Uh, <clears throat> I can't see any reason why the, the load peak wouldn't have been changed, affected any more than the transportation peak which was also changed. There's a whole lot less greenhouse gas emissions going on right now because everybody's sheltered. <coughs> That's probably the only good part about it. Uh, aside from that, the, the pandemic is a, a nasty thing. So I'm, I'm sure that, uh, now whether this is gonna continue, uh, whether Florida is gonna have to totally shelter and, and shut down again to get back to some kind of, I don't know that I can't, I, I hope that Florida is not normal right now, or I, I want to move to, I don't know if anybody would invite me. Um, so let's see. All right, that kind of does those questions. Let's see now, there was one up here. <coughs> the chat, let's see. Oh, Peter, okay. New York, okay. Thank you. All right, operating reserves. Uh, let's look at the time. 11.24, the screen is not giving me a count on the number of slides. <coughs> Another question. Nope, don't see it. Maybe that didn't go away. Oh, okay. I answered that. I answered that. I'm forgetting to click the answers. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe that was a short break you needed while I was doing a little bookkeeping on, on questions. All right, operating reserves. We, we already know that we need them, uh, but they have names. <coughs> Contingency reserves, uh, that's for sudden failures and, and NERC requires that. Then there's the non-event based reserves. Oh, okay. Uh, short term fluctuations in demand as well as load following reserves. Okay, uh, meaning non-event based reserves, meaning an event would be loss of a, uh, a generation or a transmission line or a distribution line. But a non-event is just normal grid usage that results in some fluctuation. The regulatory and frequency control reserves have to be spinning. Well, right now they do. 
but if the regulatory and frequency control reserves become storage with inverters, electronic inverters, then they won't have to be spinning because they just need to be monitoring the grid. And if they see a change in frequency, then they ramp up. So they don't have to spin. But if it's a spinning generation, then they need to be spinning so that they don't have to get up to speed. They just need to synchronize in in order to give a little extra bump to the uh, production side of the grid. And loss of generation is detected by system frequency decrease. That's why I just implied in that previous comment. <clears throat> so uh, it's fairly straightforward what has to be done. Here's a situation, for example, if we lose a large generator, then the, the governors on the other generators notice that, oh my goodness, now they're demanding a whole lot more electricity, so we're gonna have to kick in a little more fuel to, to deliver more torque so we can deliver more uh, angular velocity and get our speed back up so we can produce up to our rated response. And then there's the AGC response, which is the system automatic generation control which if necessary, kicks in additional generators uh, if the existing generators online can't pick up on the loss of load by simply uh, increasing their output. So just a comment here that the generator inertia, uh, the frequency drops and then the governors increase it back again. So, all right, what about this transmission stuff? Well, <laughs> you deliver it from lower cost and remote sources to a lot of other places like you enable sharing of large low cost generation among systems and reduce the need for planning and operating reserves and, and, and do all these good things, which you can read about if you order up the slides and you can read them now if you're a fast reader. They simply make the supplies more available. And hydro is particularly useful because you can't just put a hydro plant any old place. But if you got a good hydro supply, I mean, think about the uh, Bonneville power. Uh, some of these units up in Labrador, for example, uh, with, with uh, hundreds of thousands of megawatts, uh, or not hundreds of thousands of megawatts, hundreds of megawatts. Um, it's nice to have a way to get them other places. And we're going to show a DC transmission line here later to show one of those applications. Um, one approach to expansion of transmission is to do incremental and then just to ensure reliability. Another is, uh, <clears throat> all of incremental, but then if you want to relieve system congestion or just improve the economics, then you might want to add uh, additional transmission. <clears throat> or you may want to uh, just allow remote sources to remove, reach all energy markets uh, without affecting the existing AC transmission systems as, as you put additional transmission out there, uh, sorry, generation, and you don't want, uh, if the existing transmission is already running at near peak of capacity, you might need some additional. So um, what did LRL and RL conclude? Well, uh, new transmission could address general increase in grid congestion. All right, that's one thing. And uh, Another interesting situation when PV is peaking in the West, say at uh, one or two o'clock Pacific time, that means that somewhere around four or five o'clock Eastern time. So if we had East-West transmission, it might just be a, good, a, a, a way of uh, almost like storage to help relieve the peak capacity on the East Coast by making electricity at noon or one o'clock or two o'clock. Actually, the, there's not a whole lot of difference in PV output between about 10 in the morning and two in the afternoon. So that means you got a four hour period where you can be delivering 
electricity to the east and uh, uh, helping out. And maybe economically, depending on the cost of the transmission line and the amount of use. So what about AC and DC transmission systems? Again, these are graphs, they're a little bit busy. So if you're really interested, you can study these after you order up the uh, uh, slides. Uh, but as you can see, cost per thousand miles, the AC transmission line gets kind of expensive, whereas uh, 800 kV uh, plus or minus 800 kV, which is, um, you know, between plus and minus, the, that's 800 kV above ground and 800 kV below ground, so that's uh, 1600 kilovolts or 1 1.6 megavolt total line to line. Uh, that's pretty cheap if you go a thousand miles with it. On the other hand, uh, not nearly as cost effective in 250 miles as in a thousand miles. So it depends how far you're going to go. If you uh, want to use DC transmission, AC transmission, let's all figure, people have done the math on this. So not too hard to uh, decide what kind of transmission line you might need, depending on where you want to go with it. So DC is usually somewhere between 300 and 600 miles, depending on uh, uh, on the load and, and, and the difficulty of building the line, if it's in mountainous country versus uh, flat country and so forth. So uh, the nice thing about DC is that uh, there's two things that happen with AC. Uh, actually, a long, long transmission line acts as an antenna and you actually radiate power away from that long line. <clears throat> and the AC also crowds toward the surface of the conductor. That's called the surface uh, or skin depth of, the, of uh, whatever the, the uh, conductor is. Whereas DC is uniform ac uh, across the entire cross section of the conductor. What does it mean? It means the same size conductor can carry a higher DC current than AC current uh, because it uh, doesn't crowd the, the surface as like AC does. So the downside of DC is you have to convert AC to DC at the, uh, the start of the line and you have to convert DC back to AC at the end of the line. And so that's why you need the extra distance because of the cost of the, the, the rectification at the start and the inversion at the end. But anyway, some nice, nice picture here, nice numbers, useful and study it if uh, you get the slides. <clears throat> Another useful picture of footprints of transmission lines. You notice the right of way you need for an 800,000 volt DC line is the 270 foot right of way, whereas you're looking at 900 feet, three times as much, more than three times as much for a 5,000 megawatt capacity, uh, six single circuit AC line, whereas you got 6,000 megawatts on an 800 kilovolt. DC line with a 270 foot transmission. So um, <clears throat> here's that uh, <clears throat> DC line, lots of hydropower up there in Labrador. And one of my favorite places in the whole world is Newfoundland. And I've been there three times now. And the last time I was there was just last summer and I noticed something kind of unusual that I didn't remember seeing before and I looked into it and sure enough, they had built a DC transmission line. I noticed it down there uh, closer to, uh, to, 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 to the, <clears throat> the, the southeast corner of Newfoundland. But then when I looked it up, it, it's going all the way from up in Labrador where there's a lot of hydropower underneath some underwater and that's straight up there and then down to uh, near St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, <clears throat> Muskrat Falls, Labrador to Soldiers Pond, Newfoundland. And here's what it is, it's 1100 kilometers and uh, 700 of them in Newfoundland, 400 in Labrador. It's uh, overhead and underwater, 900 megawatts high voltage DC, 350 kV. And this is what it looks like, sitting alongside <clears throat> some 
some AC transmission lines. You can see, tell the difference. The DC transmission lines, there's two, two conductors. Uh, the plus the one across the top is your ground. Whereas with the DC or the AC, <coughs> which is running parallel over there, you can see the three for the three phase conductors. So another 10 years, the reason this look, doesn't look so nice right there right now is because this system was only two years old at the time that I took that picture. But uh, those trees ought to be growing back in there pretty soon. And they'll leave that maintenance road there. But otherwise, they, as you can see with the AC lines, the vegetation grows in around them. So <clears throat> what about the Chinese? What are they doing? Well, they've got 1,000 kV, 6,000 megawatts, and they've got a 1,438 kilometer uh, plus or minus 800 kV. They've got another 1,907 kilometer thing. The advantage is a decline in cost. The risk is if you lose one of these, <laughs> you, you can lose a lot. So uh, you take a little bit of a risk by building big DC transmission lines, but Chinese are uh, perfectly content in doing that because uh, they're building, as we saw sooner, they're building a whole lot more PV and a whole lot more, uh, well, for that matter, they're building a whole lot more hydro as well. So they're building a lot more renewables. They, they learned their lesson the hard way with all the dirty air they got from their coal generation and almost had to close down the Olympics. Now we closed down Olympics because of COVID-19. But back then it was almost closed because of dirty air from coal generation. Anyway, <clears throat> so how do we meet the 80% renewables technical challenge? We're coming close. No, we got 20 minutes to go, so we're, we're doing okay. Um, Sometimes I can see on the side of my screen the uh, actual slide I'm on, but when I do full screen, I uh, I guess I don't have to do full screen, but I, anyway, I'm using my... Uh, dispatchable means it's predictably available for planning ahead, okay? So some renewable sources are dispatchable, like hydro. We can plan ahead. We'll have water over the dam tomorrow. We'll have geothermal available tomorrow. CSP means concentrating solar power with thermal storage. What that means is uh, you may have seen pictures of some of these, or you may have actually visited some of the uh, concentrating solar power plants uh, in California. Uh, there are a number of different designs, uh, either a trough type or a mirror type where they reflect the sun up onto a, uh, uh, basically a big boiler. <clears throat> up in, in the sky. It's not necessarily a boiler because it may be have liquid sodium or something like that as the uh, heat transfer mechanism. But you can heat stuff up during the day, store it underground, and then take it out again at night and use it for standard steam generation type uh, utility. So uh, CSP and then bioenergy, of course, if you're burning wood, chips or something, uh, you can save those, burn when you want. Here's a Q&A. Let's take a look, see what we got. Hmm. Uh, that'll go away. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, okay. But we're only going to do 63. Okay. So um, we got to move a little fast. Oh, we're on 49 of 75. Yeah, okay. And we've got 63. And the extras from 64 up through 75, they're a bonus for anybody who wants to have some extra calculations involved uh, when you order up the... Uh, uh, the PowerPoint, or, or, or you, when you order up the slides. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. <clears throat> Energy of inertia of spinning rotors is important in grid. Um, I'm going to give you a quick answer, okay? 
uh, it, it, it's compensated for with PV and wind by using storage. One of which is flywheels. Uh, flywheels can rotate really, really fast. And their output could be converted to DC and back to AC on inverters, okay? And so if there's any issue of frequency that is detected by the uh, inertia of a flywheel, the flywheel can kick in and try to stabilize. Other <coughs> energy storage mechanisms, such as batteries, they all use inverters. So within a few milliseconds, they can detect changes in grid voltage or in grid frequency. And add renewable energy that has been stored to take care of that. Now, the other part of it works the same way. If there's too much renewables, then there's not enough storage. The idea is you either then have to curtail the renewable to store them. So the bottom line, one word answer here is storage. All right, and, and we have a separate two hour on, uh, on, on, on storage. So uh, if, if you're interested in going in more detail, uh, you can check to see when PDH is gonna offer that again. Okay, William, I hope that answers. That's the best we can do in a short time with a really good question that uh, there's a lot of bases that cover it. All right, so let's see here. Okay, so <clears throat> dispatchable. Some renewable are dispatchable and uh, wind and PV are not completely, uh, to some extent, partially dispatchable. That is, uh, there's been a lot of work done on forecasting when the wind is going to blow and when it's not going to blow and where it's going to blow and where it's not going to blow. And there's also the business of distributed generation that uh, covers some of the variability because if the sun is, if I have a cloud over my PV system at my house, the person a mile away may not have a cloud over their PV system. So if there's thousands of them out there, then there tends to be a, a smoothing of the variability of the output and uh, they become a little bit more dispatchable, all right? So, uh, but, the, but certainly there are challenges. And the answer for the most part is uh, if we want to deal with them and go all renewables, then we need storage. We can't do it without storage, okay? And the exact amount of storage, uh, we deal with that in the webinar on storage. Uh, but it, it's pretty straightforward to calculate exactly how much stor storage you might need in order to because we already know how much uh, quickly dispatchable generation has to be kicked in right now, except now that quickly dispatchable generation happens to be fossil. All right, so PV and wind have less variation if aggregate over a larger footprint. Okay, just said that. PV output will vary more than wind output. Yeah, know that too. Although wind can be gusty and kind of nasty to mess with. Um, <clears throat> if you install PV at the distribution level, that can challenge the management of distribution voltages. We hinted at that earlier that uh, we may need some electronic controllers to uh, avoid damaging of contacts in uh, 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 switching taps and substations. <clears throat> um, the CSP we were just talking about, depending on how much is stored, uh, they can ride through a six hour variation. And uh, again, depending on storage levels, we can ride through whatever we need. Institutional challenge is also interesting to mention. Uh, how can flexible technology solutions be enabled? 
Yeah, somebody has to say it's okay to do it. We can have all the technology in the world, but if the Public Service Commission won't approve it or if the utilities won't even propose it because they know they might get turned down, uh, whether it's generation, whether it's transmission, whatever, uh, we got to be working together to make these things work. So, <clears throat> Uh, technical operation is just the beginning, as we know, and most of the technical problems have already been solved. Uh, there will be better solutions coming up, but we have a lot of solutions already. Um, work has been done on wind, for example. A lot of work has been done from integration. And uh, federal, state, local jurisdictions, the, the, the impact of the various institutions. It's really complex. I don't have to tell this group that, I don't think. I'm sure you probably deal with it almost on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> you know, just getting a permit to, it, it, you can install a residential PV system in two days, but you sure can't get a permit in two days in very many locations. So the institutional challenges are very interesting. And even finding an inspector who knows what to look for now is getting more difficult again. Uh, so yeah, we got to work on that. We got institutional challenges that if we don't solve them by training and education, all these technical solutions will, will just sit somewhere in the shelf without being implemented. Uh, here's a wind example. You can see the load itself is green in, in megawatts. The wind generation is the red curve. And if we subtract the red from the green, we get the blue, which is the net load. And you can see what some of the issues are when this happens. The thing to be looking at is, well, first of all, it's possible that the wind could generate all the electricity that's needed and it would go negative that that doesn't show on here but it's a possibility but one of the challenges notice the slopes on the green curve the negative and the positive slopes they're relatively small and not of a very long duration but look at the slopes on the blue curve and then think back to that modeling grid example where we were looking at a ramping source and how that might affect the stability of a grid. So this is something needs to be dealt with. Now, I'm not saying there's no solution because the, you can't get a solution unless you identify a problem first. And, and this is pretty clearly identified. So now people just need to figure out how much storage or other means do we need to solve that problem. All right. And see, this is a time scale of almost a week. So we're not, uh, uh, lo looking at something that's happening in a matter of minutes here. We're talking about things that are happening over periods of, of a number of hours. And then here's the whole question, what if the load goes negative? And there, of course, is where you need to either store it or curtail it or something. So there are some recent analyses. Folks have uh, analyzed wind generation over a large footprint in the Eastern Wind Integration and Transmission Study. And there was another one down at West with solar and wind. And uh, a 5% solar penetration was studied out West. And uh, we'll take a look at the slide. Here's what happens. Notice that the more all this says in so many words, is those things that look closer to, uh, rather than being all over the place with a huge standard deviation, whatever you want to call it, the ones on the bottom are where there are more units. So it's basically a diversification over a wide area by having a lot of wind units working. And this goes between zero load and full load. So the biggest variation is at about half load. And then as you get to low, low load and full load. So the argument could be made that you just have to build a lot of these things have them all over the place. So when one isn't working, another one is there to make up for it. So 
these are our one hour changes that are shown in the black dots. Um, photovoltaics, uh, study hasn't been done to the extent that it has been done for wind, but for PV you may have to draw graphs showing one minute changes just because clouds come over and the output of system drops pretty quickly when a cloud comes over. I've, I've made lots of those measurements, but I certainly vouch for that. Uh, another option with PV is to track. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the array that's basically facing toward us here on the screen, that's a tracker and it moves basically, it, it's a one axis tracker. All right, and this one here is a fixed tilt south facing. And that's a single axis tracking and it, it tracks from southeast to northwest, which is kind of interesting because winter peaks, this is in Florida though, about 10, uh, five miles from me here. Uh, but there's something to be learned here because in the winter, the, the peak is in the morning and the sun in the winter rises in the southeast. In the summer, the utility peak is in the afternoon and the sun sets in the southwest. So if we track north, southeast and northwest, we are actually augmenting the needs of the utility early morning and late, early morning winter and late afternoon summer. The fixed tilt south facing uh, generates a fair amount of kilowatt hours over the year, but it doesn't do this early morning, late afternoon peaking that the tracker can do. The price you pay, of course, is the tracker takes up more space. It's more expensive. You gotta monitor it and so on. But uh, <clears throat> these are some studies that still need to be done to see which have better economics. But if you can increase your dispatchability a little bit with the tracker, why not? Financial impact? Well, General Electric did a study and they said, hey, if we, if we can uh, do better wind forecasting, we can save money. All right, seems like that's a no-brainer. And with perfect wind forecasting, they could save another 25 million. Uh, California Energy Commission, so an intermittency analysis, uh, $4.37 per megawatt hour benefit for a state-of-the-art wind forecasting and 95 cents a megawatt hour for perfect wind forecasting. So in other words, that's that, that you can, if you can forecast better, you can charge less for your electricity. But the wind forecasting <clears throat> still isn't covering large wind ramps, so that needs to be worked out yet. Pricing, some generation has capital operating and fuel costs, others has just capital and operating costs, no fuel costs. So clearly you wanna get as much as you can out of those. On the other hand, those that have fuel costs, the only way you pay for them, their operation is for the electricity they generate, and they can't generate electricity without fuel. So you can see what the, the pulling forces are here. So uh, uh, if the capital and operating costs are the same, obviously the no fuel cost is gonna be preferred. So, uh, and, and uh, wh wh whether or not, uh, or not even taking into account the greenhouse gas generation. So, but, but there's a balance that has to be worked out. And the easiest way to do that is simply to eliminate the fuel costs altogether and have strictly renewables, because then we don't have to worry about having to burn fuel in order to pay back the cost of the plant. Uh, look for that. Those of you who are gonna be around in 2040, I think this is what you're gonna see. I don't think I'm gonna be here, I'm 76. So uh, that's iffy about being here in 2040. But I'm looking forward to these kinds of things happening because the economics are very favorable now. Um, capital costs are fairly thermal, uh, fairly comparable for thermal and variable, but uh, people are starting to look at thermal plants as, as uh, dinosaurs, <clears throat> thermal meaning, you know, fossil. Uh, but nuclear is also a, a uh, 
<clears throat> thermal source. And nobody's really saying they should shut down, but with nine cents a kilowatt hour as the levelized cost of energy, there probably won't be a whole lot more of them built when they're competing with uh, uh, renewables at half that price and with no fuel or disposable cost. So anyway, right now the thermal units <clears throat> need to back up the variable units, but if we have enough storage to back up the variable units, then at some point in time, and possibly within the next 15 years, all the thermal years can, units can actually be phased out. So in the moment, we've got a dilemma of uh, trying to minimize the cost of the consumer. <coughs> and uh, that means they kind of have to run those. Well, right now they have to run the, the fossil plants anyway. But that will be something that will ultimately, presumably, solve itself. Now, flexible loads. Uh, how are we doing on time? Close. Uh, charging and discharging electric vehicles. Nice flexible load example. You don't necessarily have to charge your car when you plug it in. Uh, I have a plug-in hybrid. I will plug it in when we get home at night. Well, yeah, if we leave. But we can plug it in and it doesn't have to start charging until um, <clears throat> later in the night when the electricity is cheaper and more available. <clears throat> Production of aluminum can be scaled back. Thermal storage, hot or cold. Sometimes cold is stored for air conditioning and then brought back during peak times. Smart grid that is smart enough to talk to individual users and bargain back and forth with individual smart homes and smart buildings about whether they want to buy or sell electricity because a lot of these smart ones and especially the zero energy buildings, <coughs> they're going to have electricity available to the grid when they want it. This is one of the things that the uh, power wall, the uh, Elon Musk power wall is uh, ready and waiting for. Uh, and half of this ERCOT load, that fine acronym that we learned earlier, is responsive, meaning you can turn it on and off uh, and, and it's uh, doesn't really hurt the consumer as long as they know about it. But you can't turn off more than half of it at any particular time. And then there are limits to how long you can leave off water heater off, for example, before you turn it back on again. Um, but demand management for air conditioning, water heating, pool pumps and things has been along, around for a long time. Flexible generation, same thing. We've talked about these already, so we don't need to uh, go to a lot of detail on these, uh, but hydropower, uh, if you pump it back uphill again, that's a nice storage as well, so that it's uh, there to use again another time when you need it. Uh, and the short response from hydro, uh, half hour or so, uh, that can be very compatible with various environmental constraints on hydro. Energy storage, pump storage hydro, been around for a long time. They originally started for nuclear because they had excess nuclear at night. They didn't want to ramp down the plant, so they stored it, pumped water uphill. Compressed air in underground caverns. Battery technology, boy, it's going like crazy with uh, flow batteries. And again, if we, <clears throat> we cover these in the storage, I just want you to know that they are available now. <coughs> Large capacitors. The flywheels are actually commercialized. All right. And so if you don't have to turn off your very gen variable generation, if you can store it instead, and if the storage has pretty high round trip efficiency, that means you can't get 100% return on investment. If you put in 100 units of energy into storage, Right now, about the best you can do is 96% with a good lithium battery system. Uh, others are in the 80% range. So what will it do to the grid? Well, here's what we got now. We make the stuff at generation, transmit it to a substation, 
substation distributed to a neighborhood and a transformer feeds maybe three houses or something and then, then there might be another big transformer with a big load and that's kind of all one direction electricity. But here's where we're headed. A little more complicated and again you can figure that out. <coughs> um, it's 12 o'clock uh, and guess what? Let's look at the ideal energy source that operates efficiently at all output levels, follows the load precisely, is economical to operate, is not subject to fluctuations in fuel price, doesn't pollute, including carbon dioxide, lasts forever. See, that's where we lose out on the sun because it's only going to be around for another four and a half billion years. And then we'll have eight minutes to figure out what to do because it takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to the earth. And it can be developed, installed, and used by hostile countries without causing a threat to others. Think about that for a while. I don't think we care what country happens to manufacture and deploy and maybe even sell to us photovoltaic modules. So that's it, folks. Uh, I'm going to take a look now and see if we got any more questions or comments. We do have some Q&As here. Let's see if we can go quickly through them. Spinning rotors, there are 49 and 75. We're done with those. Uh, while I hear what you're saying about nuclear costs versus thermal costs or renewable costs, why is it predicted that electric fuels will go up in New York due to the loss of Indian Point? Oh, well, it, uh, we're, I'm talking about new nuclear. Indian Point's been there for a long time. Uh, and, and that was built relatively inexpensively. There's no capital cost left on that. But if you want to build a new one, then it's you're talking about nine, nine cents per kilowatt hour LCOE. So yeah, temporarily costs will probably go up if they retire Indian Point. Okay, I hope that uh, uh, answers that question. Uh, now, what else have we got here? Uh, Oh. Okay, I don't see any more questions there. Let's see if we have any, there's two more over here on chat. Let's see what we got on chat. Okay, and, and here's a, a message here on chat from PDH source. Gives you all the information you need for when it comes to an end. Okay, and I guess that takes care of it. We appreciate, I, I'm a retired college, college professor. Uh, we are into quality control in that kind of business as well. We always have questionnaires at the end of the course for students to evaluate. We very much appreciate your evaluations. We'll do the best we can to put them to good use. So uh, unless we have what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop sharing my screen <clears throat> and I'm going to watch for anything to come up in uh, either the chat or in the uh, Q&A. And I'm going to be watching the number of part of uh, attendees. And when the number of attendees drops down to zero, now, <laughs> how do you get out of this thing? Uh, find your your, your uh, icons, and in the lower right hand corner, you should see a red one that says leave. So you just click on that, and you can get out. But uh, like I say, so. I'm glad you took the time. Hope you learned something, found this was useful. Um, and we hope we'll see you back again for whatever additional continuing ed credits you maybe need. Jeffrey, you're raising your hand. Uh, oh, okay, maybe that's on chat. Let's see.
Hope you all have a great rest of your week. And uh, I hope that uh, if you have uh, continued interest, you'll order up the slides and uh, hope everybody gets 100% on the quiz. By the way, the slides will help on the quiz if uh, you don't realize that. That's something you need to know. Okay, talk to you later. Bye.